Of all the cars I'm fortunate enough to video, none have the power to make me as excited and as childlike as what has always been my favourite car of all time. What else could it be but a Mini? And the one we have here is a very early one. So today on Twin Camp, we're going to go deep into the development and engineering of the Mini and then begin to understand how this sweet little economy car became such an icon and as a result, one of the most important cars of all time. The format that the Mini pioneered has become the basis of the modern motor industry. So before we can even start to think about the Suez Crisis and Alec Izagonis, we must first understand what the average small car looked like before the Mini came along. In the decade after the Second World War, car ownership was still relatively low, and the most common small cars were things like the Austin A30 and Morris Minor. But as the 1950s progressed, car ownership was picking up as rationing ended and butskalism appeared to be working. These political conditions are important as they're the only reason the Mini exists. In 1955, Winston Churchill resigned as Conservative leader and Prime Minister to be replaced by his Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden. Eden's Conservatives won the 1955 general election, but disaster was just around the corner. While Eden was Foreign Secretary, revolution broke out in Egypt, driving the British out and leaving Gamal Abdel Nasser in charge. As we know from more recent history, the Suez Canal is a vital artery when it comes to trade, allowing ships to cut through Egypt rather than having to travel around the perimeter of Africa. And in 1956, this was no different. The ownership of the canal was private, split between French and British interests, but Colonel Nasser was not on board with foreign control over an Egyptian asset. As a result, he declared that the Suez Canal Company was to be nationalised, and this greatly angered the British and French, leading them both to essentially invade the region with the help of Israel. In 1956, however, they lacked the political clout to see their invasion through. They were all still reeling from the Second World War, and the United States, who had become the superpower, told the three nations to go home. The former Foreign Secretary, Eden, had just committed a foreign policy calamity, and he resigned in disgrace after less than two years as Prime Minister, to be succeeded by his Chancellor of the Exchequer, Harold Macmillan. The consequences of Britain's last attempt to retain some global power hit the motor industry hard. Oil shortages started to take their toll and in December 1956, the government had to introduce fuel rationing. Overnight, the demand for cars dried up as people either couldn't afford to fuel their vehicles or didn't have the rations available to them. The only segment of the industry in which demand increased was for microcars. People were suddenly clambering over each other to get their hands on Isettas, Messerschmitts and Bonn minicars. A man named Leonard Lord was president of BMC, Britain's largest car company and the product of a merger between Austin and Morris. At Lord's disposal was the genius of Alec Izagonis, who the decade before had designed the Morris Minor. Lord made his feelings towards these bubble cars rather clear. God damn these bloody awful bubble cars. We must drive them off the streets by designing a proper small car. And so, Isagonis did. The Mini, therefore, was not designed to replace the Austin A30 or compete with Citroen's 2CV and the Volkswagen, but rather to enable those driving bubble cars to get into something that didn't have a motorcycle engine and that wasn't built from lollipop sticks. The closest comparison then is to the Fiat 500 and 600, but the Mini was radical in a way the Italians weren't. Isagonis and his small team of engineers wanted the new car, then known as ADO 15, to absolutely maximise its practicality from an incredibly small footprint. Now, there are cars that are indeed smaller than a Mini. For example, it wouldn't have met the K-car regulations in Japan. But the Mini had to seat four people, and by that I do not mean children. Four adults 
had to be comfortable in this car. And so the little design team had their work cut out to fit a four cylinder engine, four adults and a proper boot into a 10 foot length and a width of four foot seven. Isagonis had the engineering principles the Mini would utilize in his head for decades, but it took a project of this ambition for them all to be fleshed out. The most famous element is found under the bonnet. The vast majority of cars from this era, along with everything designed by BMC, was front engine, rear drive, with the engine mounted longitudinally under the bonnet. This was simple and well proven, but impractical. It takes up a lot of space to have an engine, gearbox, prop shaft and rear axle, and you can see all the wasted space around the engine in this Morris Minor. An alternative is to have an engine with fewer cylinders or to mount the engine at the back, but neither of those choices left Isagonis feeling confident. Front wheel drive had the promise of more predictable handling and better road holding, so that was the avenue that ADO 15 would take. The solution was to mount the engine transversely, but that left Isagonis' team with another set of challenges. The first and foremost of these was the gearbox. The initial plan was to mount it on the end of the crankshaft, exactly as you'd see in a rear drive car or a modern front drive car. But in the width permitted, Isagonis decided that they couldn't retain enough steering lock. So the gearbox was instead placed underneath the engine, sharing its oil in the sump. The drive would be dropped down to the box through a set of gears, and this arrangement allowed the drive to exit the gearbox from the centre of the car, meaning equal length drive shafts and therefore, theoretically, no torque steer. The second most obvious component to face a challenge was the radiator. In a longitudinal setup, this would of course be at the front of the car, with the fan pulling air through the grille, cooling the engine. However, in 1959, BMC couldn't, or wouldn't, employ an electrically driven cooling fan, so the radiator had to remain at the front of the engine, or at the side of the Mini's engine bay, so that the fan could act on it. The fan instead pulls the air through the front grille and into what was the back of the radiator and out into the wheel arch. The engine that BMC decided to use was their existing A-Series, the power plant that had also propelled the Austin A30 and the Morris Minor, but in the Mini it began to cement its legendary status. Though on paper, this tiny overhead valve Siamese port engine with a little SU carburettor perched on top may appear exceptionally unexceptional. In this form, it displaces 848 cc, producing about 34 brake horsepower and 44 pound-feet of torque. But the A-Series is very tunable, and while Minis eventually moved away from this tiny capacity, thanks to the car's feathery curb weight, any A-Series could pull the Mini along incredibly well. It's the strength, economy and willing torque the A-Series produces that kept it a staple of the British motor industry, and that's without even mentioning the noise the A-Series with its gearbox in sump made. That whine and grumble were the soundtrack of Britain from the 50s through to the 90s, and there's a very good reason why these engines have cropped up absolutely everywhere and continue to nearly 70 years after its introduction. The A-Series is a vital component in the Mini's character, and as we'll discuss in a future video, was a critical component in the car's transformation into an icon. But even this pre-existing element of the Mini was altered between the prototype stage and the car's launch. The prototypes had a 948cc displacement, but considering the era and the market the Mini was aimed at, the fact that some prototypes had been clocked at over 90 miles per hour forced BMC to nerf the performance by reducing the stroke, bringing the engine down to the final 848cc. Some of those prototypes also had their A-Series turned the other way, with the distributor at the back and the carburettor at the front. But BMC found an issue with that, though it's still unknown the exact reason. The eventual effect of this setup, however, is that all the Mini's ignition components were now right in the firing line for the great British weather to wreak their havoc on. 
but the end result was an incredible increase in the practicality of the car. No longer was a significant portion of the car's footprint dedicated to the engine, but instead to the passengers. And comparing the size of the engine bays between the Minor and the Mini shows us just what a huge leap this was. Now we're getting towards the road, we can talk suspension, because BMC were not about to stop innovating. The Mini has independent suspension all round, something we still don't see on all modern cars. But the thing we're really interested in is the springing. Coils were considered too bulky and leaves, well, the less said the better. So instead, the Mini uses rubber as its springing medium. The system was designed by Alex Moulton and it consists of a little rubber cone that sits in a seat and that acts as the spring with a standard shock absorber alongside it. This meant that the Mini could have a variable spring rate, meaning that the more things you put in it, the stiffer the suspension gets and therefore it doesn't end up bottoming out. But of course, the biggest reason for this was how compact it was. There's no need for any struts at the front and at the back they were mounted horizontally so there's no intrusion into the boot. While this setup may have made the Mini a rather harsh ride, it pushed it head and shoulders above almost all else when it came to cornering ability. And it's arguably this fact that encouraged BMC to take the Mini into motorsport, enhancing its public image and the car's widespread popularity as a tiny performance machine. But as with the A-Series, that's something we'll be exploring in a future video. The innovations just kept coming, even down to the wheels. Now, most small cars of this time period used rather large wheel rims at around 16 inches. But for a car so small, that just wouldn't cut it. So BMC got Dunlop to develop them some tyres for a 10-inch rim. And that is the perfect size for a Mini. A small wheel means a small tyre diameter, and a small tyre diameter means a small wheel arch, and a small wheel arch means, you guessed it, more space for actual people. Along with packaging the car so well and using an engine as economical as the A-Series, Isagonis' team paid an enormous amount of attention to trimming weight out of every possible part of the car. Ignore all ideas of crash safety right now. This is 1959, and take the doors as an example of that weight saving. The frames are wafer thin, the hinges are external, and the only things separating the driver from the exterior are a single door skin and a bit of fabric. Even the door latches are simple. They're exactly the style you'd find on a door at home. The windows join in too. They slide across rather than roll down, and all these little touches come together to a curb weight of 587 kilograms. I could cradle this car under my arm, it's so light. But moving back towards practicality, those measures cultivate an interior like no other. Internally, minis are as big as you would ever need. In fact, I would feel comfortable living in a mini. There's so much room in here. Just take my immediate view here. There's no proper dashboard as that would just take up space. Instead, the bulkhead is simply lined in vinyl and the lower dash rail provides the support for the steering column and a shelf that's big enough to fit all of Boris Johnson's children. Photos and videos of minis play a perspective trick on you, as you cannot actually begin to understand just how much room there really is in here until you actually sit in it. My knees are further away from the dashboard in here than in virtually any other car, and the shelf in front of you really is huge. I mean, upon it we have things like this original Morris Mini Minor owner's handbook, um, and we're going to have to have a little look through this because it's just exceptional. There are no photographs in it. Everything is hand-drawn and the technical detail is unlike anything on any kind of modern car. But stuff like that will just sit very nicely on the dashboard, as will this period Johnson & Johnson first aid kit box. I love period things like that, but that will just sit on the shelf of a Mini. 
But alongside the shelf, you have these enormous door bins, which are big enough to fit bottles, and they extend from the front right to the back. And in the rear, you have even bigger companion boxes. All this space, though, is partially thanks to a complete lack of equipment. Minis only have four features that are not absolutely necessary in a car, and they are all thanks, yet again, to Alec Izagonis, because he was a chain smoker, and so the Mini has four ashtrays. This particular one only has three, because the centre one has been taken up by some aftermarket seatbelts, because Minis would never have had these from the factory in 1960. But considering there are four passengers, each one gets their own ashtray. But Izagonis purposefully designed the dashboard so that you couldn't fit a radio easily. Because he felt the radio was a distraction while driving, but clearly smoking quite a serious amount of cigarettes was absolutely fine. That may make no sense, but the rest absolutely does. The main feature of the Mini's interior, and the one element carried over into the modern age, is the single central instrument. This means that it doesn't have to be swapped over between left and right hand drive, but it also breaks up the vastness of this empty space. The only two gauges within display your speed and fuel level. On its cowling there's a small courtesy lamp for the parcel shelf, and an overhead lamp above the passenger side B pillar. Below the speedometer is a simple row of switches containing nearly every auxiliary control. These two toggle switches control the wipers and headlamps, the two pull switches the heat and choke, and then in the centre is the ignition. The starter switch is a button located just below the passenger seat. Outside of the panel are a plunger for the manual windscreen washers, a foot operated button for the dipped beam, and a simple indicator stalk that flashes. But it's in the driving controls that things begin to look a little bit agricultural, as the steering wheel juts out at an incredibly strange angle, very nearly like that of a bus. But that's due again to the fact that they've tried to make the car as small as humanly possible, so you are pushed as close as possible up to the steering rack, and therefore this position naturally presents itself and BMC weren't about to use a universal joint in that steering column to make it seem more normal, because again, it's 1959 we're talking about. Similarly, the pedals are microscopic and are all tucked in around the steering column, and again, the gear lever as well is also very strange, with an enormous travel to it, and it actually goes straight into the back of the gearbox down here, there is no kind of remote mechanism at play here. But folding yourself into the back of the Mini isn't the chore that you might expect it to be. In fact, with that seat set for me at the front, there is more than enough room here. There's not loads of room, but there's just enough for me to be comfortable and to slide my feet under the front seat. In fact, I'd be perfectly comfortable here on quite a long journey. I mean, Minis do get quite noisy and quite bouncy, so that's an issue, but in terms of actual just seating comfort, there's no reason why somebody couldn't sit here alongside me in the back. They really did manage to fit four adults comfortably in this car. Additionally, I could fit all my baggage that I need for my journey, for maybe my holiday, down in just this companion box next to me. And of course, I could have a smoke as well because I've got my own personal ashtray here. I do find it utterly ludicrous that possibly the most practical car of all time, at least all things considered, is now 62 years old, and thanks to all the pressures of the modern world, this level of practicality will never be bettered. What's more, there's even space here in the boot. Now, it's not enormous, and the hatchback hadn't really been invented, so the Mini is a proper saloon car, though the door folds down. But when the boot is open, the number plate hinges down so you can drive along with larger loads. When people describe Minis as TARDIS-like, they really aren't kidding. How BMC managed to get so much space in this car, I do not know. But it's a serious feat of engineering that only 10 feet of Mini has more space in it than many a modern car. <laughs> 
And in those tiny dimensions, Isagonis managed to chisel out an utterly timeless shape. The man was never a well-regarded stylist, only an engineer with a fetish for simplicity. So every component is small, simple, and practical. In fact, the original prototypes carried a pressed metal grill that was considered too austere by BMC management, as Isagonis was told to jazz it up a bit. In keeping, it seems, with that attitude, this example has received a few modifications over its 61-year life. It has these small chrome eyelids, proper wing mirrors, and wheels from a Cooper S, but that's pretty normal. Minis were built to be modified. It's with that taste for minimalism, though, that the shape he fleshed out became so identifiable. Nothing that was around in 1959 could be confused for a Mini, and with the characterful face the car carries, managed to slowly find its way into people's hearts. But it was all in the interests of practicality. It's a box with four wheels pushed as far as possible into the corners, both for better practicality and better handling. It may seem an alien thought to all of us today, but even the style of the Mini was radical. It was so small and stumpy that people didn't know what to make of it. Some commentators even called it ugly, but how could you do that to a Mini? The views of the time are summed up best, I feel, in an article from 1961 in Motors and Motoring. The Mini has caused a great deal of controversy and probably more interest than any other car in recent years. The design of these remarkable little vehicles broke away completely from the established conception of what a car should look like and how it should be laid out mechanically. At the Mini's launch, it was known by two names, either the Austin 7 or Morris Mini Minor, like the car we have here. The badge engineering of these models is useless, as they're identical other than the grills, badging, and minor trim. But thanks to the love directed at this little car, that was very quickly simplified to simply being the Mini. And although the Austin and Morris were later joined by a Wolseley and Riley, it took only 10 years for the company that became British Leyland to realise the recognition the Mini had, and to allow it to live as its own brand. So this car, at its launch, was £496.19. and shillings. That number may not seem an awful lot to anyone today, but it was less than the Austin A35 that ceased production at the Mini's launch. It was £28 cheaper than a Fiat 500. It was £68 cheaper than a Citroen 2CV. It was £92 cheaper than a Ford Anglia, for heaven's sake. The Mini was better engineered, faster, handled better, and was more practical than any of those cars. Why you'd have chosen an Anglia over a Mini in 1959, I do not know. But it did take the public a bit of time to come around to the idea of minimalism. People couldn't get their heads around the fact that this little box could fit within it a whole family. And I'd expect as well that there was a bit of the bigger is better mantra going on. But once people did catch on to the Mini, that was it. During one month in 1960, almost one in five cars sold in Britain were Minis. Within 17 years, they'd built four million of the things. Surely then, this little car brought some proper success to its manufacturer. Well, no. BMC was, in almost every way, a backwards company. The merger between Austin and Morris took place because both companies were facing difficulties, and the level of incompetence within led to BMC losing about 30 quid on every Mini they sold, at least at the beginning. That 4 million figure isn't actually all that impressive either, taken at face value. But it's only with the nuance and circumstance that we see its power. These sales were all despite BMC's catastrophic fall to bankruptcy, rampant industrial action, iffy build quality, and an ever-declining export market. The basic car was so good that despite no replacement on the horizon, very limited investment, and an increasingly dodgy image, the company that became British Leyland relied almost completely on the Mini. And for 20 years, it remained one of Britain's best-selling cars.
In the March of 1957, ADO 15 existed only as a sketch on the back of a fag packet. But four months later, they had a running prototype. And 25 months later, they had a production car. For an engineering effort of this magnitude to hit the road in that amount of time is unheard of. The effort that went into making the Mini a reality is admirable, and in the circumstances, it's unsurprising that there were a number of teething issues. But in April 1959, the first Minis rolled off the production lines at Longbridge and Cowley, starting a legacy that remains rich over 60 years later. It didn't take long for the motoring press to hail the Mini as the future. Such was its tenacity on the road, charm and immense character. We all know that the Mini is one of the all-time greats for both its design ingenuity and the grin-inducing handling that won it so many motorsports triumphs. But that story will be coming soon. For now, this is among the first Minis. As pure as Isagonis wanted it to be, and as cute as it would ever be. For Alec Isagonis, this was his finest moment. This is how the man is remembered. For all the turmoil of his early life and his status as a refugee at 15 years old, then moving to England in the early 1920s, Isagonis is responsible for some of the most interesting, quirkiest and successful British cars ever to exist. But it's his attitude towards his designs that endears him so much to me. The Mini rolled out of the factory at 10 feet and a quarter of an inch long. And it's been said by John Shepard, who was part of the Mini team, that this really annoyed Isagonis. And that's telling. The man who was single-minded enough to get this car launched as pure as it was, and therefore as lovable and successful as it was, was the same man who saw that same single-mindedness overtake sense. Isagonis was pushed out of his position in 1969 thanks to his attitude. The man was undoubtedly a genius, but geniuses don't always win. In a couple of weeks on Twin Cam, we're going to be looking at Isagonis' last car. One that yet again showcased his genius, but that underwhelmed the public and was symptomatic of BMC's fall towards bankruptcy. But until then, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.